Seeing none, uh, Senator uh, Joe Comerford. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, uh, Chair Lawn, Chair Friedman, honorable members of this committee for allowing my testimony on, on two of my priority bills for this session. I'm also submitting detailed written testimony. Um, the first bill um, is S748, titled An Act Supporting Equal Access to Community Care for Elders and Disabled Individuals. I filed this bill in partnership with Rep. Natalie Higgins. Her bill, H227, was referred to the Committee on Children, Families, and Persons with Disability. Um, chairs, as you know, there is universal agreement that the best setting for long-term care is a person's home, if possible. Uh, people thriving in loving, familiar environments amid family and friends um, do better. The care is less expensive and improved comfort and morale have been shown to lead through research uh, to better outcomes. Particularly today, as you know, with our acute nursing home staffing shortages, state policy should do as much as possible to promote independence and to reduce uh, institutional care. To further this goal, MassHealth has set up several programs such as PACE, which is, as you know, the program of all-inclusive care for the elderly, and other home and community-based services to support community-based care for elderly and the disabled. However, Mass Health, a Mass Health eligibility rule says that if you make just a few dollars more than the limit, you are ineligible for the program and must choose between either um, one, entering a nursing um, home facility to receive Mass Health assistance, or paying out of pocket for care until you spend down your income to just $542 per month. And this means uh, essentially that you would be left with only $542 to pay for all non medical living expenses each month. Um, this is a classic cliff effect um, situation, and this bill offers a targeted solution. It allows individuals to remain in PACE or HCBS programs by paying simply the amount by which they exceed the eligibility cutoff as a monthly premium. In addition to allowing individuals to maintain care at home and remain in their communities, this bill would also uh, reduce the amount that the Commonwealth spends on long-term care. Um, the second bill is legislation I introduced with Representative Christine Barber, S749 and H1246, an act protecting the homes of seniors and disabled people on mass health. The phrase medical, Medicaid, excuse me, Medicaid estate recovery is the name our system gives to a policy that is actually, for me, hard to fathom. When people who are currently low income, who received mass health benefits after the age of 55 die, in some cases, the law forces them to repay the state for the cost of health care services they received. While federal law mandates that some Medicaid costs be reimbursed this way, MassHealth's estate recovery program goes beyond the federally set floor. While federal law limits recovery for long-term care, MassHealth may demand repayment from families of the deceased recipients who receive any Medicaid services over the age of 55, including doctor and nursing care, prescription drugs, or other services. Um, no other, to my knowledge, low income assistance program demands repayment like this. We do not expect, for example, recipients of connector assistance or SNAP food assistance or homeless, homeless shelter uh, service recipients to repay the state. Despite the fact that Medicaid exists to provide care and services to those who cannot afford it. In these instances, the benefit is essentially in the form of a loan that must be repaid upon death. And at least when people take out a loan, they know they're taking out a loan, but far too many grieving families, and I, I know you've received their testimony, are caught by surprise when an exorbitant bill arrives in the mail unexpectedly and they're grieving for a loved one. Or uh, an elderly person may understand this and be wrestling with whether or not to go get the care they need, um, fearing that they won't be able to leave anything behind for their beloved children or other family members. It's worth noting for us that half the amount collected is then sent off to the federal government. Constituents of mine experienced this issue on a personal level. The disabled son of a MassHealth recipient was living in a house that MassHealth attempted to seize for repayment of care for his mother um, which she had received as she was dying. MassHealth was seeking over $108,000 in repayment, 
that could be collected only by selling the family home in this case, leaving the deceased person's disabled son homeless while he was stable actually in the house with little income or chance to find another home, all again while grieving the death of his mother. After filing a hardship waiver that was subsequently denied, this family was sued by MassHealth, the legal department. They ultimately prevailed after years and mounting legal bills, but the family is completely fractured. Our bill would shrink the program down to just federally required minimum. It would also reduce the interest rate on money that is owed, expanding the criteria for hardship waivers, and it would require more accessible information be provided to MassHealth members about the possibility that their assets might be seized after they die. One final point, as the Commonwealth, um, one tool for decreasing a racial wealth gap is to encourage home ownership, as you know, and to build intergenerational wealth in, in communities that are disproportionately low income. This policy is the exact opposite, as it has the effect of taking away homes from families that have worked so hard to build up some equity. On both of these issues, Chairs, I want to recognize that our colleagues, our very tireless colleagues at MassHealth have recently made regulatory changes to improve both of these policies. These efforts by MassHealth Health staff and propelled by advocates have made a really significant difference. And while I, I, I welcome, I, and many welcome these initiatives, they don't go as far as, as I would suggest uh, we could, and they can be re rescinded at any time. Therefore, chairs, I respectfully urge the committee to report favorably on both of these bills. And I thank you so much for allowing me to testify. Thank you, Senator Comfort, for your testimony. Um, any members of the committee have